Dear all, welcome to Anamet Library Talk. At today's talk, we have distinguished speakers with us, Daniel Gomez and Mark Phillips. Today's talk is entitled The Past, Past Web Exploring Web Archives. Since 2006, a book has not been published that reflects the state of the art in the area of web presentation and the research that has been conducted on web archives. The main goal of the new book, The Past Web, Exploring Web Archives, was to create a new, up-to-date resource to educate more people in the field of web presentation and to make web archives known to research and academics. The book aims to support professors in their mission to transmit innovative and adequate knowledge for the digital literacy required to train professionals for the 21st century. This book is available in green open access. At this point, I would like to introduce you our speakers. Daniel Gomez started Archivio.pt in 2007 as follow-up follow -up of his PhD thesis and cur currently leads this public service. He has been a researcher in web archiving and web-based information systems since 2001. He obtained his PhD in computer science with a thesis focused on the design of large-scale systems for the professions of web data. Daniel Gomez was the chief editor of the book, The Past Web, Exploring Web Archives. Our moderator, Mark Phillips, is the Associate Dean for Digital Libraries at the University of North Texas Libraries in Denton, Texas. His areas of interest include workflows for digitized and born digital content, digital preser preservation systems, web archives, and metadata quality. He has been involved with the development of, of the Portal to Texas History, the UNT Digital Library, and the Gateway to Oklahoma History since their inception. He has been a part of teams that have received funding from U.S. federal agents, agencies, such as the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, as well as state organizations, such as the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. Additionally, he has worked on many foundation-funded projects to support content digitization digitization that leverage digital library infrastructure in many ways. He has served in leadership roles in international organizations, including the International Internet Preservation Consortium and the ARC's Alliance. Dear attendees, please, please be reminded that your video and audios are closed. Please type your questions in the chat section. Your questions will be answered in the Q&A session. Now, I'm passing the word to Mark Phillips. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, what is this evening for you all and what is this morning for me? Um, I am, as, as I was introduced, I'm at the University of North Texas, which is in Denton, Texas in the United States. And um, I'm really excited to be able to moderate this talk. Um, we're going to be starting with um, Daniel doing a presentation, and as was mentioned, we'll be taking questions after the, the talk. Um, if you have questions, you can add them to the chat, and then we will um, work through those questions after the talk um, and hopefully have some lively discussion about um, web archiving, this book, and kind of the future of this space. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Daniel to um, tell us about the past web. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Let me just first share my screen to see if everything is okay. So, Mark, could you please just that, confirm that you hear me? That looks great and we can hear you. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this introduction to the COS University for inviting us to talk here a little bit about our book. Uh, also to Mark for, for accepting the invitation of being a moderator. And thank you to all the participants for being here after a, a, a day of work. I hope that, that you enjoyed this presentation. And please feel free to talk about the book or any questions or thoughts, comments that you have about web archiving during the, the questions um, um, session. 
So the name of our book is The Past Web, Exploring Web Archives. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about how this book was born and what you can find in it. So starting from the beginning, um, uh, last week or the, in the, during the past months, I went to three conferences about web archives. So hundreds of people were there. But in the beginning, the first conference that I attended was the web archiving workshop in 2003. It was um, within the European Conference on Digital Libraries. It now is the TPDL, Theory and Practice on Digital Libraries. It was a workshop on web archives. And at this time, it was, we were like 20 people in the world that were interested in web archiving. Um, so here I, I show a screenshot of the web page of the third ECDL workshop on web archives. It was web archive. And this was very important to me because it was also the first time that I actually published a, a, a work as a first author. So at the time I published um, this paper called A Characterization of the Portuguese Web. Um, you can see also here that even in 2003, people were already building thematic collections um, about the, in this case, the September 11. Uh, it was interesting that I, I, on one of these conferences that I attended during the past month, there was someone studying, actually it was Ian Milligan, which is also a name that you should uh, look for. He's an historian from the um, University of Waterloo, I think. And he was uh, presenting uh, work about the, the web archiving and the information about 11 September. So it's interesting to see it happened in 2001. It ha then in 2000 and, and, um, and three people already looking for this information as historical information. And um, in 2023, people are looking for this information. So actually, just by showing you this example, just one screenshot, you can already see how important web archiving is. Uh, you can see also here political communication, web archiving, addressing typology and timing for selection, preservation and access, learning by doing a digital archive for Chinese studies, archiving the sick work issues and challenges. So in 2003, people were already quite aware about uh, the challenges and about what should be done. Um, actually, most of this information would be lost if it was not uh, web archived. But fortunately, in 2006, uh, the first book on web archiving was published. So gathering already all this, this uh, experience and, and knowledge that was built in the early days of, of web archiving and web archives. And uh, there was this book published by Springer. Um, and uh, the main author, or editor was Julien Massanet which is basically the father of web archiving in Europe. In, in the United States, Brewster Kell created the, um, the Internet Archive, and more or less at the same time, Julien also uh, started the first efforts to create uh, web archiving initiatives in Europe. And Julien gathered a lot of information, and this book was one of the most interesting books and basically the Bible of web archiving for, for many years. Um, so I, I, I was a researcher, so in 2003 I was starting my, my PhD, <laughs> sorry, and uh, in 2007 I finished it and, starting, and started the Portuguese Web Archive project. Um, here you can see a screenshot of our first project uh, website. So this is also archives at archive.pt. So we archive ourselves. Um, and um, so basically this was just an idea to start an archive for the Portuguese web in 2007. Um, today is a running service. You can try it whenever you like. Um, so I gathered a lot of experience from, um, from developing and managing these services, this service across time since it was a project until, until it is a, a running service that, that it is today. So um, in TPDL, that, as I said, uh, was the conference that succeeded the European Conference on Digital Libraries, 
the TPDL occurred in 2018 uh, in Porto, which is a, a city in the north of Portugal. And uh, at the time, we promoted a tutorial in conjunction, conjunction with the RESO network. RESO is a, a, a project or a network that aims to create a research infrastructure for the study of web archive materials. And during one of these uh, lunch breaks at the University of Porto, um, the Ralph from Springer, that was the, the, the responsible from Springer for the, creating the first web archiving book, um, addressed me, asking me if I wanted to write a new book as follow-up to web archiving. So the, the book web archiving was very interesting, but it was published, it has been published um, many years ago. So it was published in 2006, we're already in 2018. So there is a need for a new and updated book about web archiving because web archives have been developing a lot. So uh, the community, the scholars, people need uh, a new book and Springer want, wanted to, to publish it. So uh, at the time I was not very convinced because my work is basically to manage and develop uh, web archives. Uh, I write some papers, some technical reports, but writing an old book seemed quite overwhelm overwhelming to me. So I asked uh, help from, from other people that were already there. The, the, the person that you see on image is, uh, is Jane on the left, she, Jane Winters. So I asked her if he could, she could help me. She said yes. And I also introduced the other editors on the, on the following slides. So basically we, start, we started working on writing the past web. So the objectives of the book was, were to raise awareness about the importance of preserving information published on the web. And this is the main challenge that, we, that web archives still have. Um, in the beginning, the problem was that there was no technology about to support web archiving and people didn't know about how to do it. So it was basically a technical problem. Now the problem or the main challenge that web archives have is that people are not aware of the importance of preserving information published on the web. So almost all the information that everyone uh, consumes every day uh, is produced, is born digital, and then is published online. So the, the amount of information that runs our societies and runs our lives uh, basically is published exclusively online. So, and there is not an awareness uh, by the society, by scholars, by politicians, that if this information is not preserved, if these documents that are published online are not preserved, we're actually not preserving almost anything, or we are preserving a, a small amount of the information that is consumed. So we can publish books on paper, a few of them, but most of them are uh, read online. Uh, web pages are published online and are read by people, uh, there, are also web, there are also pages printed on paper, but the amount of printed pages on paper that are read are very, is very small. So here we tried to address this problem so that anyone could use this book to show about, to, to raise the awareness and show how important it is to preserve that, the information that is published online. Um, and uh, we as web archivists, our mission is to preserve information, to provide services that enable to collect and then provide access to information published online. And we wanted to contribute to the, the professors and the teachers so that they can train the professionals of the future on also on web archiving. And this was a challenge because I, I raised this challenge uh, many times to the professors saying you should teach about web archiving in your classes. 
about information science or computer science or in any area actually um and they said okay but there are no there's no pedagogical support so they, which book do you recommend and i said i actually referenced a lot of papers but that's not really handy to give a, a student a bachelor student or 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 a, a master student is not very handy just to give them a lot of papers apparently disconnected among each other so it's much better to have a book so there was this need for having a pedagogical resource that could introduce web archiving basically to anyone um and web archives these days already offer a lot of services there are interfaces for programming interface interfaces for programming uh, new applications there are um, uh, search services there are a lot of information that could be uh, accessed uh, sometimes only by researchers but many times by anyone so these services must be disseminated so that anyone can make use of them is the first step to to launch or to to have a running service that people know it so we can develop a new service but people must know it otherwise uh, it will be just something that is there for ourselves and it, that's not a service people must use it so um and people must know the services and um in the beginning the, at the book web archiving most of the contributions most of the art articles were about how to archive information from the web and there, there has been so much research work that inspires new use cases and new research work that has been done meanwhile so we also wanted to share this this research work so that other people could improve these works or continue them or make similar works so basically it was, it was to provide inspiration for new research works so these were our four main objectives so to to achieve them these were the other editors that helped us they helped me it was elena demidova and thomas Riese also helped helped us and contribute strongly contributed to editing this book because other, otherwise i will not be able to to edit the book so i was just the coordinator and these were uh, the, the editors that uh, basically gathered authors that we tried to to identify new work that has not been published before not in conferences not in previous books so we tried to put on this book innovative work and uh, elena jane and thomas helped me helped me a lot on this work and without them it would have not be possible to create the the past web book so in the end we gathered 40 authors from 12 countries around the world um, and we were very pleased with this final work it was quite a, a challenge to manage all these contributions uh, but in the end uh, we we're quite pleased to have a book that now anyone can can read um, and the 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 people the targets of this work were, of this book were uh, these five five <coughs> um, user groups first as i told as i said professors so that they could teach about web preservation in their class having an adequate uh, support and um, the second one the researchers so that so that they can study the past web the past through the web this is very important is not to study the past web the the web is not a, 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 an object of study is actually a source of information about any subject that occurred during the 21st century so this is very important that all the researchers know that web archives exist so that they can study the 21st century because studying the 21st century without considering the documents that were published online is a very incomplete uh, study so we don't want that to happen so to have sound and, and scientific studies we want the researchers to be able to to also uh, study the past using uh, documents published online um, computer scientists these are this is the group that usually uh, 
uses Web Archive more frequently um, to develop new applications to explore the past. The past, so we are aware that is impossible to develop applications for every UK use case for uh, every user group. So what Web Archives uh, do is they provide the infrastructure that collects information before it disappears and then provides access. And we leave uh, or provide services to, so that uh, computer science then can, computer science or developers can create uh, new applications more suitable to given uh, target of users. Um, information professionals, this is very important uh, so that they also preserve online information. I think that knowing about web archiving is a basic skill for any information professional this year, these days, because as most of the information is born digital and published online, if information professionals such, such as archivists or librarians do not address this kind of information, their scope of activity becomes very, very restricted. Um, so we wanted to also target this, this book. But anyhow, the book could be useful to any citizen who use the internet, which is these days almost everybody, so that the past can be as accessible as the present. So most of the information that we want to find about what happened yesterday or last week is basically accessible uh, immediately. So we go to Google or to social networks and we immediately access information that about events uh, that, that occurred in the past days or few years. However, and this is very, very quickly, and you can do it on your cell phone, on your computer. It's really, really accessible, the, the, the present. But if you want to access the early past, something that happened 5, 10, 15 years ago, this becomes really, really challenging. Um, because um, as most of the information was published exclusively online and disappeared, um, it becomes really, really difficult. So um, the first part of the of the book, oh, sorry, missed here something on this slide. So the first uh, part of the book is something that anyone could read. That was the idea. So basically was to um, raise awareness about the problem of web ephemera. So about the information that appears and quickly disappears and uh, the, the, give a brief overview about the work that web archives have been doing to preserve our digital collective memory. So basically part one, the idea was uh, to answer the question, why should uh, the web be preserved? Uh, basically it's because we are in the era of, of information abundance where you can find every information very quickly, but memory scarcity. So we can get information, maybe too much information about what's currently happening, but it gets really, really hard to get information about what happened five, 10, 15 years ago. And this could be really a big problem um, to make good decisions when we are so overloaded with present information and when it gets so difficult to get uh, information about the recent past. Um, on, on this part, on the problem of, of a family chapter, we make a, an analogy with the, the movies, so animated images. And sometimes we talk about the web as, as, as if, it, if this was something that was a new problem. It's a new problem, something that never happened before. And here we make an analogy with the movies and we can see that basically history is repeating. So movies in the beginning were, 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 or audiovisual content was also not considered to be useful, not considered to have place in libraries, not to consider to be part of cultural ever heritage. And today, uh, nobody will argue this. So. If you read this chapter, you're going to see the analogies between the two media of communication, the two medium of communication, um, web archives to preserve information published online and uh, audiovisual archives when they appeared uh, were also um, 
uh, were, were created also at, by, by individuals or private organizations uh, to preserve this new medium that was the movies at the time. So basically, this also gives us some, some hope or, or at least some awareness of where we are. So we are in the beginning of web archiving as a new medium in the same we are in the same stage that people were 100 years ago when they were trying to preserve uh, audiovisual content. Or at the time, only visual because the movies did not have audio. Okay, so <laughs> part two addressed how to collect information from the web. So as information keeps on appearing online and also quickly disappearing, it is in very important to collect it before it vanishes. Um, and here, there were contributions from several parts of the world, from Australia, from Singapore, um, and also about how to, um, to collect different types of media, such as uh, social media, um, the case of Twitter. Uh, and this was, uh, I think that the author of this Chapter is also attending this webinar. If I did not miss anything, so uh, at the at the questions, I invite Zeynep for uh, to to join us also. Um, and actually, this work is very interesting because sometimes Twitter is or social networks are presented as something that is not archivable, but you can see in this chapter that it, it can be archivable and deeply analyzed. Uh, even now, with all this controversy about the restriction uh, of access to Twitter, it still provides a lot of very interesting information. And um, the last chapter was about how to create event-centered collections from web archives. Uh, this is quite interesting because when we show web archive to someone or to a researcher, in the beginning, they get a little uh, skeptical, This, the, like researchers or professionals uh, focused on, on any area, they're very focused on their problems, on the specific research questions. So they kind of be skeptical and ask, so what am I going to, to find in the web archive? So in the beginning, uh, they think there's not a lot of information for them. And then when they start using web archives, the problem is that they got too much interesting information for them. And this chapter, creating event-centric collection from web archives, is uh, basically discuss how could you create automatically uh, collections about given events so that then researchers can uh, focus their attention on uh, given events. And this can be done in an automated or semi-automated, using semi-automated uh, process, processes. Okay, going to part three. So part one, we presented, presented the motivation. A part two, we showed how the web can be collected. And on part three, we addressed how to access historical web data. So um, without access, there's no preservation. So if we, if we, are, if we, are we would just be collecting and, and, and not providing access, this is not preservation. This is just storing information. So information, uh, must be accessible. Uh, and there are several access methods to analyze uh, the past web. Um, and here we presented how to support full text search and URL search over web archives, how um, web archives can be seen uh, through a more holistic view by several several levels of access, by analyzing several access, access methods. Um, and it's very important also that web archives are open in, uh, so that it can be automatically processed um, to create new information and so that users can also find what they need across web archives. And this third chapter, interoperability for accessing versions of web resources with the Memento protocol is very, very interesting. And, I, I, and the Memento protocol was basically a breakthrough on the interoperability that uh, enabled the creation of a lot more uh, applications. Um, here we have another contributions by Zenep, linking Twitter archives with television archives, 
in this chapter uh, also connect with our initial motivation about how web archives could um, be uh, similar or are similar at a different stage of development to the movie archives. So basically, information that we need can be on any medium, and it's very important that it can be interconnected and analyzed so that the questions can be answered by analyzing information. Um, web archives have a lot of information. Basically, they have all the information that is available online. So most of it is uh, HTML pages and uh, images. So here we wanted to present uh, or to contribute with a, a chapter about image analytics in web archives. So these are the images are very interesting for for everybody. Um, and this chapter addresses how images can be analyzed. Okay, so after information is accessible, researchers can study it. And here we wanted to share some inspiring, inspiring examples about research that has been done using uh, basically the, the accesses method, access methods that were briefly uh, presented. So we can see here the first chapter is about digital archaeology in the web of links, reconstructing a late 1990s web sphere. So it's quite interesting how we can uh, see how the web evolved from the from the 1990s until today. So this kind of work can be done. This retrospective can be done basically also also using this chapter. Um, so the the web is is documental. So most of the times you go there to look for a given document, a given web page, a, a given website. But uh, we can also analyze quantitatively how the web evolves across time. And this uh, chapter by Jane Nielsen uh, presented quantitative approach to um, basically studying the Danish web using the Danish web archives. So here presenting a more uh, high level view of the information preserved. Um, Anat Ben David presented or contributed with a, a critical web archive re research um, uh, reflection. And she basically argued how web archives can be interesting from a social and political uh, perspectives. Um, here we have a, a, a clear example about web archives can contribute to digital humanities on the fourth chapter, exploring online diasporas, London's French and Latin American communities in the UK web archive. So by the title, you can see that this has all to do with humanities and uh, not with the computer science or information technology as sometimes people think of when you talk about web archives. Um, the final chapter is about platform and app histories, assessing source availability in web archives and app repositories. Uh, here we can see how uh, web archives can be used to uh, study applications that are most of the times uh, installed in cell phones. So it might not be a use case that is immediate because we think these days the, the border between uh, internet, uh, desktop, cell phone, mobile it's, is, is not very clear, but most of the times we see as we see the, the apps as something disconnected from the public web. And this, this uh, study shows how as everything they are interconnected. Okay, uh, part five how to make web archives become infrastructures. So in the same way that libraries and archives became societal uh, infrastructures, uh, web for, 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 for organic or analog uh, information, um, web archives must also become infrastructures for modern societies so that we don't, we don't uh, fall into memoryless um, societies that are quite dangerous. 
So they must be, uh, web archives must be infrastructures for the memory in the in digital uh, societies. And here we, we wanted to show how web archives could be used as infrastructures to develop innovative services. And first, we, Niels Brugger, uh, which has a very long career on studying web archives, he argued about the need for research infrastructures for the study of web archives. And then we provided um, several different examples about how uh, can this be done. So um, the first one was the automatic generation of timeline timelines for past web events. This actually this was the first um, were the first winners of the Kiev.pt awards. So the Kiev.pt awards are our annual awards that start in 2018, in which we we give awards to anyone who uses uh, our services to create an innovative uh, application or make an innovative study. And <coughs> actually. This work was in the origin of the feature that we have now in archive.pt that's called the narrative. So basically, people go there, write a, a, a given set of keywords, and it automatically generates timelines of news. So this saves a lot of time. And we, uh, we, we, we in this case, archive.pt will never be able to do this. And with this new application, uh, it was an added value um, um, service. So the other one was uh, political opinions on the past web. So opinions change across time. Uh, political opinions change quite often and people frequently forget. So it's quite important to kind of track how these political opinions um, can be uh, analyzed across time for accountability purposes also. Uh, so this study addressed that. Uh, old web today is a running service that enables to browse the past web with browsers from the past. <clears throat> so um, actually the formats on the web are quite stable. So in 2023, you can still uh, the, 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 pub, the information that was published in the 90s or early 2000s is still quite accessible. So you can use a browser from 2023, open the code from the from a page from the 90s or early 2000s, and it still works. And you can still read, obviously, that the, the, the look and feel is not the same because we have bigger screens, higher res resolution, but the information is there. <coughs> Excuse me. But this may not be the case uh, always. So old web dot today basically enables anyone to browse the past web with an emulation of a browser from the past. So if a web page was created, for instance, using code developed during the, the browser wars, you can look for this event browser wars. The browser wars were basically a war between uh, the Internet Explorer and the next Netscape Navigator in which uh, they, were, they started to, to make uh, source code that only worked on one of them. Uh, and this uh, basically uh, um, caused some information to be hidden because when you opened that page, just as uh, uh, um, an image appeared saying, uh, you don't have the correct browser, install a new one. Okay, so this may seem a little weird these days, but at the time it happened. So it may happen that you are in a web archive, you get a, a web page that has this information or that is not correctly being displayed. So you may have to launch a, a, a browser from the early 2000s to access the information. And um, the final chapter, is uh, called, was named Big Data Science over the Past Web. So um, I, I don't know if big data is still the big buzzword this day. Now I think that the big buzzword is uh, artificial intelligence. Um, a few years ago, it was grid computing. But anyhow, 
The issue here is that data is required. And people that and the people that have the data, people have the power. Because these days you can have the algorithms, you can have the computers, but if you don't have the data, you are very restricted on what you can do. Um, so to, to study uh, information from, from large amounts of data, for instance, to create large language models, such as the one that supports JetGPT, you must have the data. The problem these days is not, is not the software, is not the algorithms, is not the computers, it's the data. And we have a big issue these days is that the large amounts of data to, to train this kind of algorithms or do this kind of researchers is almost exclusively owned by private companies that do not provide access to it. So web archives can be maybe the only uh, infrastructure to provide big data sets that can support data, big uh, open data sets to support uh, science. Um, so I think this could be also be the target of reflection uh, because otherwise we may have, we have all the world, the world producing data, but all this data is basically being kept uh, by four or five companies in the world that are almost all of them in two, three countries the most. So um, these reflections are done here also uh, at the last chapter. And to conclude, we have uh, a short, <coughs> a short um, chapter that also part of a short part that also invite anyone to read um, is a, a look into the future. And it was written by Julien Massanet, uh, Daniela Major, she's an historian and myself, but my, basically this was the result of uh, an interview several several hours of interview of chat with Julian in which she gave us a perspective about what he learned in more than 20 years of work in this area and um, it, it uh, we were very pleased with this short part of the book because it condensed a lot of knowledge about what should be the future for web archives which are the challenges uh, how a web archiving should be addressed. Okay, so, so far I presented the content of the book. I hope that I motivated you to take a look at it. Uh, but in this book, we also created or made an innovation. So what happens is that citations, uh, here you can see, uh, you can see uh, um, a part of the book in which you have a screenshot of a web page that was uh, printed or included in the book. But this is not the original artifact. This is a poor quality or low fidelity copy of the artifact. The original artifact is not on paper, is not an image. The original artifact is a web page, is an upper textual document. So an upper textual document uh, is composed by several elements. It has links, it can have interactive uh, content. So um, a content to be um, an artifact, to be preserved, adequately preserved, all these uh, characteristics must be also preserved in the same way that we do with other artifacts, such as movies or paintings, we must keep the original characteristics of the artifact. So what we did is that every time a new URL was cited on the book as an example or as a, or as a citation, a proper citation in the bibliographic session, um, we um, extracted this URL and archived it on archive.pt. So if you are looking at the book, and you get a link that no longer works, you can go to archive.pt and access the information that was published. And there you can follow other pages, you can browse, you can use the original artifact as close as possible as it was published. We 
think and we think that this should be a, a practice that should become common like all the, because all the books the papers the articles almost all of them they cite a lot of information that was published online uh, and when they cite the, the information that was published in a conventional way in pdf it's accessible it's somehow preserved by the publishers or other cultural heritage information but if they cite a, a, an information that was published exclusive online most likely this information will disappear and this degrades the quality of the book so we think we would like that every publisher will start doing this in preserving the cited URLs on, on their uh, published uh, documents. And here you can see an example of uh, some citations of the book that are no longer available on the live web. Here you can see here that the author carefully presented this work um, virtually and VR, VR ML software studies after Manovic electronic book review and he, he carefully he said it, where it retrieved and now it's no longer available so basically this <coughs> that this reference could have been lost forever but if you go to archives.pt and look for this url you can still find the document that your author wanted to cite okay uh, Okay, so, so far we had some promising uh, results. So the book was already downloaded 23,000 times since July uh, 21, so about two years ago, while the web archiving book was downloaded 3,000 times since 2006. Obviously, we are in different areas, uh, sorry, in different eras. <coughs> sorry because <clears throat> in 2006 printed books in paper were, were still quite common and this is and, and these days most of the information is uh, consumed uh, online or in digital format people hardly print information so they also use ebooks or devices like kindle or cell phones or tablets or they download the book and print it. So, so this is also a sign about how important web archiving is, okay? So actually these numbers show how important, how important it is to preserve the, the information uh, published online. Um, and, uh, the book is already being used to teach about web archives at the University of North Texas. I invite next to I have this I have this surprise for Mark, so I, I, I'm going to ask him instead of him asking me how is it going using our book. Uh, so he has a, a course on web archiving, he, in which he uses the the book as support, and this was the the initial motivation to uh, to write this book. So we're very pleased to notice that this is happening in practice. And we hope that a lot more professors follow the, the example from Mark Phillips uh, and start using this book or other books, doesn't matter, uh, and start teaching about uh, the, the preservation of the documents that are published online. So to finish, um, I invite you obviously to read the book, and if you want, don't want to buy it, there's a preprint version available at this link, archive.pt slash book, so you can browse its contents, and then if you like it, you can then buy it from, from Springer. And this is what I had to say in general. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll now pass to Mark. All right. Well, thank you so much for that um, that talk. Uh, it um, it was really interesting to hear how everything came together, and um, you answered a bunch of questions that I that I had starting off um, from this book. But um, we have a we have. Uh, I would like to remind the audience that if you have questions um, 
for Daniel, please go ahead and add them to the chat. We'll be kind of going through those as we can. Um, and then I'll, I've got some uh, questions as well. So I'll, I'll kind of mix them um, together. So one of the things I wanted to talk about, and, and this slide actually um, highlights it, is you you made this book available, um, green open access, you made the preprint available. And then um, from what I understand, the, the publication was also freely available for um, libraries in Portugal for a time. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Was that something you negotiated in the process? Or was that something? Yeah, just really just tell me how that all came about. Okay. So actually, there's still a lot of misinformation about open access. Uh, as most publishers, they support uh, green open access. That is, you can provide a, a, a version of your, of your contribution. It doesn't matter if it is a book or a research paper before it was reviewed by the, the, the publisher. So this is completely legal. Uh, there is nothing wrong with it. Uh, and this, I think this is also very, very uh, uh, beneficial for the publishers because we know that the texts don't have the same quality, but at least they can motivate the users to, or, sorry, sorry, the readers to, to buy the book. It's different than just take a look at the index and uh, decide to buy a book for your library or for yourself or to use in your classes. So this was something that we talked with Springer and they said it was okay. They so said the they explained the rules. So the rules is that you can only only publish the information that you um, created, the text that you created before Springer uh, um, proofread it and, and improve it the, the the quality of the text. And for us, this was okay, and it fits the purpose of at least raised the the interest of uh, people to look at the book. Uh, regarding the other uh, question that you mentioned that the book, the final version of the book was available for Portuguese universities, was basically that we negotiate access to scientific publications uh, in bulk for the country, for the whole country. So we have a national consortium that represents all the universities, research labs, um, uh, higher education uh, libraries, and uh, we included this in the package. Um, we said, we asked, how could it be done? And um, they said, we could include it in uh, uh, for six months. And for us, it, it was okay. So we spread the word saying that there is this new book and you can access it if you are in, in the consortium. That's that's great. Um, I, I just wanted to give a little anecdote. I think I was I became aware of the book actually from announcements about the preprint being available. And I, I know that I was um, when I took a look at that, it was like, ah, this this is going to be really a, a great book. But it was that I, I think it kind of followed what you were saying is people have access to the preprint. And then um, because we're in the situation at our university to, to purchase the, the content through Springer, I think that's great. Um, and one follow-up question um do you have have you had any um statistics on how often the the open access version is used um I never look at it <laughs> okay I could, yeah, I was I could. Just, yeah i was curious on how how that compared to the um the statistics from springer itself um, i don't know if, if any of my colleagues is attending this but if they are in background, can you take a look at it? Maybe until the end of this session, we'll, we'll have the answer. <laughs> okay. Um, to, to, to answer one of the, um, the prompts that you gave uh, in the presentation about how this, this book is being used, at least in the one class that I've, um, so I've, I've taught a web archiving course at the College of Information here at the University of North Texas, and I've taught it twice um, the past two springs. And we were, we made use of two chapters um, in the book and in our section where we talk about research using web archives. And um, it's been really um, helpful for uh, students and especially uh, we're, we're running into the situation where many of the students we have now were born after the web started and actually after kind of 
the modern web as we think about it. Um, and so when they're presented with concepts like old web today, where you could use old browsers, sometimes it's their first experience with old browsers. Um, but one of the 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 chapters that that I have them read is from um, Anad Ben David um, and her work with uh, specifically around um, the Yugoslavian web archive or the Yugoslavian web and the fact that you know domains at least for for a lot of them are tied to top level domains to countries and when those change things unexpected things happen and um i think especially for our situation here in the united states with you know very us centric students it's their first time to think about some of those things and how those ramifications kind of just spread across the web like what happens when your .com or your .us or .something goes away like how how does that affect the work that you do so i think it was really eye opening for them to hear some of that discussion and just to kind of go through that thought process on things that they assume will always be there when they're tied to these international structures they they are not as always as 100% solid as they expect yeah, they're not solid at all. If right. you take a look at, at, for instance, there's a Wikipedia page about um, uh, social networks that disappeared. And now if I raise the question, how many were them? Uh, people may think about one or two. We're going to see, be surprised. There are dozens of social networks that completely disappeared. So Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, maybe in 10 years from now, people just look at them as a, a memory because at the time that i5 appeared or myspace and everybody was there if people said that it's going to disappear uh, because something better is going to appear people maybe at the time also may have doubt so everything is very very ephemeral and that example from yugoslavia that you that you raised is very interesting even an entire national web can disappear right and and yeah even if the just the the mechanism that drives the connections can go away, let alone the content. Um, to, to, to move into some of the discussion from the chat and some of the questions, this one I think will be something that you'll you'll enjoy, um, really enjoy talking about is how can an interested third party collaborate with the Portuguese Web Archiving Initiative? Um, well, it depends on what you want to do. So you can you can call, just drop us a line, Felipe Miguel Tavares. I don't know if you're Portuguese or if you're Brazilian, but send us an email, tell us what you want to do, and we'll help you uh, or try to find. You can collaborate on providing training, on teaching about web archives. You can use our slides for free, our videos. You can uh, create new applications using our APIs. Uh, you can use our search services. Uh, and also all the other ones that are on the book, okay? So uh, Portuguese Web Archive is just an example. We don't even have any chapter on the, on the book about it. So uh, what I usually say is do something and apply for the award, and that will be the, the start of a, a collaboration. <laughs> just right. send us an email. Um, uh, as a follow-up on uh, a slightly different um, space is uh, due, due to the rising importance of kind of these walled garden, um, you know, the ecosystems around the web and the API first based information. So um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking like things like Twitter, Facebook, or even um, uh tools where we're trying to access things through um, our, our phones, like how can web archiving services adapt to these kind of non-web access points that we're um, working with these days? Okay, so gladly we have Zainab here that was the expert on this. I don't know if you can, Arim, I don't know if you can put Zainab to answer this question, but... Um, Let me check. Because she has been working on that for many years and did very interesting work since the beginning. So basically, having the information um, accessible through APIs is not blocking, okay? Web archives can also use APIs. No problem with that. Zeneb, can you hear us? 
Yeah, I can hear. You can hear okay. me? Sure. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks for the organization. And it was a great uh, talk from Daniel. Uh, and thanks. For, I mean, um, and the question is that, yes, I have been working with the APIs for social media archiving uh, for years. And as explained in the chapters <laughs> in the book also, they have their problems. You know, today, for example, with the Elon Musk and all these kind of things, even academic APIs are suspended at Twitter. Uh, there are other kinds of way to archive, but all these can be um, integrated in the infrastructure of web archiving. For example, when archiving web pages, there are also tweets embedded inside, you know? So you have another, normally you have to, to show these tweets inside the web page you should call them from the API and get them from the API, you know, with the metadata and all these kind of things. Uh, so there are some restrictions. It's not easy task, but uh, today uh, web archivists are able to use the APIs and integrate them all the whole web archiving processes. So, so I think, um... If I understand that there's uh, there's it's available through to web archives if they are are trying to capture it and and have the the components in place to capture it. And oftentimes it, when you do the API calls, you get much more information, much more metadata. Exactly. Um, exactly. It, it takes uh, and it kind of complements what you might see on the live web. And it really takes kind of both of those to tell the full story. Exactly. Especially they are dedicated, also dedicated collections based on the events. For example, elections. Uh, there are so many co collections, uh, social media collections. Uh, the problem is that when you use the API, like Twitter API, to give you the historical data, I mean, you can get the elections data today for the elections uh, four years ago from Twitter <laughs> API as a researcher. But the problem is that all the deleted tweets or the deleted replies, they disappear, right. you know? So it's better to do this kind of archiving by streaming APIs. And these streaming APIs have some restrictions. I mean, you cannot get the whole data, but most of the time you get the statistically significant enough data for social scientists. You know, right. it's too important for the social scientists who are doing research with the social media API to understand those API restrictions, to understand technical background, how this data archived by using APIs and what kind of restrictions are used. For example, you cannot, uh, even for archiving events, you can follow people, you can use some hashtags and, but you can, for example, I will give you an example. I was working at uh, National Institute of Audiovisual why uh, uh, attacks in Charlie Hebdo happened. Okay, we started an archive, okay, for Paris attacks also, but we archived the hashtag Je suis Charlie because it was the most popular hashtag. I am Charlie, everybody was using this. But, and then five years later, someone came, a researcher, and told us I am interested in the hashtag which said Je ne suis pas Charlie. I am not Charlie. You know, and we said, okay, but we didn't think about it at the time. So it's also important to, to, to work with the researchers while constructing the archives, you know, the, the decisions, uh, especially by you for the social media. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um... Uh, looking into the comments, it, it seems like Ricardo actually got us some uh, numbers on the um, the preprint version, um, and it looks like it's uh, about about fifteen thousand uses of the preprint, um, fourteen thousand eight hundred eighty six downloads of the open access uh, version of the book, and um, I, I, I think that's especially for. Um, you know, trying to publicize web archiving in in countries that might not have access, like the same level of access to some of these um, uh, big vendors, and where the cost may be prohibitive for access to this book. Um, this is a great way for them to at least get some access to that information. 
Um, there was one question. I I did I do think that um I think I saw um Helena have uh, her hand up earlier. I don't know if that was still um something, but I, I think there was one question, and this is more specific on the, the process, is how much different um did the preprint end up being from the published version um content-wise? I know the the look and feel did change, but content wise. Uh, didn't change a lot. The the structure is more or less the same, um, but well, the quality of the text uh, after being reviewed by Springer are quite better, and some images are also better. So it's it's not that different. It will be much more pleasant to read the final version than the preprint. Uh, it doesn't not have typos, but at the level of structure, it's pretty much the same. You can compare it. All right. Um, we had another uh, question specifically about the Portuguese web archive. And um, does the Portuguese web archive provide any kinds of um, data sets for researchers, like uh, um, data scientists um, to use um, that are kind of more easily incorporated into data, data set or kind of data pipelines that they're using? Um, yes. It depends on what kind of data you want. So. So this could be a quite long answer. So we 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 know that people researchers want to have this kind of information. So basically, we provided access to our to our all our indexes, so that then the users through the APIs can extract in bulk large amounts of data from from our archives, so that they can create their own data set. So this is the first method. And maybe I'll ask Ricardo. Is, my colleague Ricardo is here. Maybe we could put the short links here. Um, and but but we also have some data sets. For instance, about the collections. So we have um, the special collections that you create. For instance, about the elections, uh, they are they start with a list of URLs. So if somebody wants to study, for instance, the European elections of 2019, instead of going over the 70 billion files we have archived there's a, a link there or there's a, an excel file a csv file that has the links that we use to create this collection okay so you can start from here and then we have also we have we've got a lot of collections that are mostly <coughs> described in portuguese but with google translate you can get a look at it like we have um, uh, lists of of um, political parties in portugal we have lists about official governmental websites. We have lists about artists. Um, we have about 20, I don't know, more than 20 data sets. Um, and now recently, this is really recent, a researcher that worked with us created a, a data set of texts, of the raw text, and then the, the synthetically annotated texts from a, a large amount of information from our web archive. And this information will be provided as uh, open data sets. Actually, it is already. Just send us an email um, and we can uh, we can share it. Um, and so this is very interesting for natural language processing. And instead of someone going and do all over again, trying to create these data sets, we incentivate that also the derived results are also made publicly available um, in open access. So basically it depends on what people want to do. So lots of lots, lots of opportunities and, and documentation available on archivo.pt for um, folks wanting to, to know more. Um, going going back, you said you had mentioned in your talk that um, when the when the book came out, there was a lot of discussion still about big data, big data. It was all big data. And it seems like now um, it's moved into AI and especially on like generative ATI, AI and uh, chat GPT. And where do you think the role of those technologies fits within the web archiving space, whether either from a opportunities for understanding what's in web archives or um, how are web archives being used to um, train or as data sources for training? I'm just kind of curious about your your thoughts on on that space. Uh, well, this is um, 
basically it's, it's always the same. So you need information to be processed to drive knowledge. Uh, then marketing people do very well their work and they start creating these new concepts to 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 market this kind of uh, products. And um, so uh, when when the, what people now call artificial intelligence includes, for instance, machine learning that has been used uh, and has been in production in, in most of the systems that we use every day uh, for years, many years, I could say. Um, so the, the, the thing here is that uh, the, the data is required, okay? And without data, you cannot train anything. And it's very interesting that some companies, like for instance, Yahoo, they, they sometimes they, they deliver or they open the train model. Uh, but most of the times, these models are not openly available, not the models, not the data sets. And even if you have the model, they don't have the original data set. Sometimes it's difficult to build on top of it. So uh, I think that the, the, the widespread of algorithms based on, on artificial intelligence uh, paradigms um, depends on the data. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I know I'm kind of repeating myself, but the problem is the same that we had before. We, everybody, most people, most governments don't have access to the data. And um, the, the web archives are very important because they provide a large amount of information of data that is current, but also uh, historical data that may not exist anywhere, at least not being publicly available. Maybe Google has all the information that they crawled the web since their inception or not, but anyhow, it's not publicly available. So if you want to get information, you want to get big, large, big uh, amounts of data collected from the web, <coughs> you have to go to the Internet Archive uh, or to archive.pt or to any web archive. Otherwise, you don't have access to this information. That's great. It's it's been really interesting, and and like you were saying, we don't we don't often know what the training data are for some of these big projects, but we do have a pretty good idea that um, a lot of it's going to be web data, and that uh, they're coming from the Internet Archive, Common Crawl, um, Archive Archivo.pt. Um, so um, they're really a foundation for a lot <coughs> of the work that's the data that's going into these. Um, kind of just. Following up with two two final um, kind of questions, I think that the the discussion that you had on, and I think this really applies for the audience and the and the library side of things. Um, when we think about modern publishing and how important the web is as a resource, so um, the the citations to websites, the inclusion of web content in the in the texts, and the work that you did to archive those web um, uh, those websites. I just wanted to tie that to some um, one of the the organizations that um, that Archivo.pt Daniel represented as the International Internet Preservation Consortium, and they just had their um, web archiving conference a couple of weeks ago in um, in the Netherlands, and there was a whole section talking about theses and dissertations at universities and the need and the fact that very few are doing this, but the need for um, archiving the web content that's being <clears throat> cited in those publications, those research, um, that those dissertations and those theses, um, and that it's something that needs to be looked at um, across, really across the world for, for this. And I, I thought it was really interesting that you you basically did that for this book, um, and I think that there's uh, an opportunity for many of us in universities who we're in university libraries. We're often the um, the stewards of those documents, the stewards of that content, and so it's it's oftentimes falls to us to do that kind of work. So it's a really great example of how we can look at that for these um, theses and dissertations that are coming to us. Yep. 
Um, oh, I, I didn't know if you had any observations for us as we we look at that, or um, uh, just uh, any ideas there? Well, I think it's it's quite of a, a burden for the librarians and the professors and the students to have to take care of their own uh, web data or documents published online. I think there should be uh, horizontal infrastructures that should take care of that in the same way they take care of other kinds of documents. Um, because it's, I think it's un unattainable to do that in a, in a comprehensive way. So fortunately now, at least in Europe, in the United States, the, the the theses are not lost, but it was quite frequent that the theses or master theses were, were lost. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and now we're finally taking care of the production of our of our organizations. And when you, talk, when you think about research labs or universities, what do we produce? We produce knowledge. Knowledge, most of the times, in the form of texts and images. So if we don't take care of this, if we don't preserve this, what is our mission? What are we doing? If you don't have, if you don't preserve the thesis or the papers or the technical reports, so this has been solved in the last years because th th this was quite uh, weird. Like when when I, okay, I'm going to confess something. I only open a printed book for my PhD thesis on the day I delivered it because otherwise I checked everything online all papers, all books. And this was in 2006. And when I had to deliver my, submit my thesis, they asked me for, I don't know, to like six printed versions of my thesis and five CD-ROMs. At the time, CD-ROMs were already obsolete. And I was like, what? And, and I did not submit my thesis on any proper repository. So basically, I did all my thesis was born online or, or, or digital and also published online then. So this was kind of a gap between reality, my reality as a researcher, my reality as part of a research lab, and the, the workflows established that were completely outdated and, and designed for a world that no longer exists. And this was in 2006. So fortunately, in 2023, the theses are not lost. There are re repositories in which you submit a PDF. And the, 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 most of the organizations, uh, higher education organizations, take care of this. Now, we have the next step that I'm, I'm trying to advocate here. That is, what about the information that was published exclusively online? The data sets, the software, the videos, the PowerPoints, the websites of the research project. Because that's what we're going to check. Like, check, look, look what we did here in the chat. We put, we have put links to everything. All of this information is exclusively available online. The the the, the complementary information to my presentation and to this book are informa is information that is exclusively available online. So I think that I would like that the next step will be to start in, in uh, integrating the preservation of online documents into the workflow of the, the universities, of the repositories, of the libraries, but it has to be done in a structured way. Uh, well, in the beginning, we know that this will be some, some, some knucklehead librarian that's going to do this or someone, but it's the way it is. So be the knucklehead in, your, in the institution and start archiving, start asking, where are the data sets going? Where are the PowerPoints going? Where are the websites going? Because this will be useful in these days. It's really easy. If you go to see the webrecorder.net project, you can start being a web archivist today. Uh, not, you're not going to create a national web archive, but you can archive the information that you think is very interesting uh, for you, <laughs> or you can also use the safe page now services that uh, the Internet Archive provides and the Kiev.pt also provides, and you can archive your information on the web archive. So the technology is here. These days, you just need the awareness and the workflows to, to, try to, to start to adapt to our, our current times. 
Great. Um, no, I, I, I absolutely agree. I, I like the, uh, be the, <laughs> be the person that starts this in your institution. Um, so actually, I think this is a, a really great closing question from Thomas here. And, um, uh, so what are the efforts to expand the topic of web archiving beyond library studies? And so um, talking about web archiving in history courses, humanities, and more. So examples, they come from um, art studies, and they also wanted to say that they really like the book and uh, have just started reading it. So um, can you talk a little bit about, um, and I, I was thinking some conversations we had before, maybe um, just you could mention the resaw um work and uh the conference and and whatnot around uh researchers engaging in web archives yeah what we thank you for this question what we found is that anyone after knowing that the web archive exists uh, starts using it right away and finds use cases for every kind of of, of for every, any area so our effort is is basically well, I'm doing this presentation, this webinar, but we know that this is uh, the, the reach of this effort to disseminate web archiving is quite limited. This is one reason why we wrote the book. So I would like to ask anyone to also be an ambassador for web archiving and for web archives, because this is not a, a matter of reaching only the digital, only the, the library studies, or we, we're trying to reach everyone, everyone, Every person, every researcher, every professor needs and is going to make use of web archives after he knows about them. Um, but advertising is quite expensive. Um, if you want to promote, if you think about it on your everyday life, if, if you have access to this kind of budgets, you're going to know that developing something costs half. Developing and keep it running costs half of disseminating it. So it means that we need a lot more budget than we have and will ever have to make web archives top of mind. Uh, if you think about the internet archive, that was the first web archive, is in, is in the internet almost since the beginning of the internet. And most people in the world don't know the internet archive. And this is, this is not the fault of the internet archive. I think this is a fault of all of us, of, kind of uh, not taking responsibility for uh, disseminating these use of useful services to don't include it in our class, don't talk about them to our friends, because they are useful and they're free. Mo uh, almost all of them are free. Um, I can give you examples of things that we have done. So we have uh, webinars, uh, we have a training, uh, we have a training program that we created, not that you want to be trainees, but the idea was to train the trainers. So um, we created this training, uh, we're gonna put here in our chat, this training program. So what you do, what you do is like, uh, we establish a collaboration with, with an institution from any area. It could be arts, it could be, it doesn't matter. It, 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 the municipalities, well, I don't know if municipality is a term that you, with the local authorities, well, this depends on the country. So like uh, with the mayor or depends on the country, what you call it. So we did this collaboration, then we do webinars in which we teach about web archiving and then they share their experiences using web archiving. And we included this on training programs for the citizens of the, the city of Lisbon. We did this with, with artists. The collaboration with artists was amazing because most artists as we all know, um, have uh, low resources, so most of the of their their results are exclusively online because it's it's uh, more it's more attainable. So they were so happy to know that their work was, has been archived and that they can preserve their own archives. <laughs> like there was this situation that we did with a lot of the arts library of the of a, a famous non-profit organization in Portugal and they came to us and they said well we used to keep the the printed catalogs of the exhibitions so there was this exhibition the exhibition then goes to another place or finishes and what can we preserve as a proof as a document of the, that this this exhibition these were the printed catalogs this was the only information 
that the arts uh, library kept. And without printed catalogs, they start having uh, like uh, uh, an empty library for recent exhibitions. So there was this need to web archive the, the catalog that was online now for most exhibitions so that they continue to provide what the service that they provide to their users, the people that they want to study art. Um, and then by starting this, then we had so much collaborations with the artists community uh, and they were so pleased on helping us on listing uh, the, the works from artists. So this was, was, um, was really nice. Um, and then uh, if you want to take a look, there are small services. I'm gonna put here in the chat that can be built on top of, of um, a web archive. This, if we take a look, archive.pt slash catalog, we have these small services, but they can be implemented over any web archive. These added value services, like for instance, uh, you're gonna, someone is gonna disable a website, we copy all the, the, the content, and then they can disable the website and we keep all the information. And the information remains available. And it can still actually be referenced with the original URL. So all the links continue to be active. And this is something, for instance, that the Internet Archive or other web archives could do really, really easily because this technology uh, is technologi technologically simple. So, um, well, basically, this is to say that web archives are for everyone. That's really great. Um, I think that's a, a, a perfect way to end um, this talk. And I, I encourage you all to, to take a look at the, the past web exploring web archives book. Um, and if, if there's an opportunity to try to incorporate it into the work that you do um, and the courses that you teach, I, I, I found a lot of value in doing it from, from my perspective whenever I was teaching. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Irim and we'll um, close it out for the day. all of you for this wonderful talk also dear listeners thank you for your questions uh, Anamet Library Talks will continue in July with uh, Bildur Tekök we will share the details on following days good evening to all <laughs>